The mainstream media has been on decline for so long now. How are we supposed to know when they've hit rock bottom? Well, today could be a good indicator as the New York Times has turned to Questlove in a new marketing effort. Yes, the New York Times will be turning to the drummer for Jimmy Fallon's house band to try and resuscitate their image as anything other than a withering relic of the past. Honestly, I respect the move because I would much rather listen to The Roots than any lefty brainwashing from The Times. Now, with this in mind, I decided to do my good deed for the day and recommend some other celebrity mascots for struggling mainstream news outfits. NPR. You guys get Bill Cosby. I mean, America's dad. Plus, he knows all about putting people to sleep, much like your coverage. Perfect fit. Then we get MSNBC. You have Brian Stelter because he's currently available as hell and obviously wanted to be Rachel Maddow's sidekick anyway. So, you know, why not? Uh, at uh, Stelter, now we have to replace him at CNN. What do we go with? Uh, an old bag of potatoes. I, look, there's a lot of value in, a, in an old bag of potatoes, and it's much better than anybody that CNN has on the air right now. And for obvious reasons, uh, finally, we get the, obvi uh, the Washington Post, which has scandal on all sides. WAPO, you are going to need the re re the reworking that only a Harvey Weinstein can provide. Yes, because at this point, who the hell else is toxic enough to get into bed with you? BlazeTV.com slash Stu. The promo code is Stu. I wonder, it, let me know if you've tried Debunked and see if it still works. I don't know. Maybe we're scamming them. Maybe we just, they just left it active. You get 20 bucks off if Debunked is still active. I don't know. That's from our gun special a couple weeks ago. Give it a shot. If not, Stu will save you 10 bucks. Alex Epstein is here with the latest on the war on fossil fuels. Something mildly important, considering our gas price issues. An innocent student is brutally murdered at a school owned by LeBron James. But we start by doing Biden's economic cover-up. What a time it's been. You know, the, the Biden administration really wants you to be thinking about, let's say, January 6th right now. They want you to, that's the prime time push. You got to be talking about January 6th. It's all you should think about. Now, they had this opportunity already when they did the impeachment last time when people were going to pay attention to what they found. Now they took a year and a half and decided, eh, we want take two. It didn't work last time, so we're going to give it a shot again. It doesn't seem to be working right now, but that's what they want you to watch. They want you to be talking about the senators reaching a bipartisan deal on gun safety. We'll get into the details of that one coming up. As you might imagine, it's just perfect. It's a wonderful anytime Republicans, Democrats can come together. Mm. It's just a chef's kiss. Mwah. You know what I'm saying? Um, okay, so let's get into the economy, though, because that's what they don't want you to talk about. They don't want you to realize what's going on in the economy and how bad it is right now. I, I hate being the guy bringing you scary news about the economy. I work with a guy who loves being the guy to bring you scary news about the economy. It's sort of like Glenn Beck's calling card. I don't like being that guy. And in fact, most of the time, I'm a little more optimistic. Most of the time, I can see you know, that we have a pretty resilient country and a pretty resilient economy, largely because the foundation of it is still capitalism. Even when we don't pay attention. We pass laws that hurt that capitalism. The capitalism's always running in the background, and it's hard to derail it. But I think we might be in for a pretty rough time. And something happened today that, that made me feel even more convicted in that uh, idea. And it's not a good thing. Let me go through some of this here. This is a, a bizarre approach by Joe Biden, and he's been doing this a lot lately. We've, I'm kind of obsessed with it, honestly, because we talk a lot about politics, and sometimes it's just PR, right? You got some PR people, you got communications experts. They're sitting back there trying to figure out a way to present the information from the president the best way possible to basically manipulate you, right? That's the, the role of so many of the people in the White House these days. Well, this is the tactic they've chosen, and I, I don't understand it. When Barack Obama was in office, things weren't going so well. We had the worst recovery since World War II from a major recession. It was terrible. I mean, it was, uh, you looked at the stats and you'd say, oh my gosh, this is awful. And what Barack Obama would say is, you know what? Times are tough because of 
you know, George Bush. And I'm here trying to trying to help out. Remember um, uh, when they would constantly say over and over again, they've created or saved a million jobs, not created a million jobs, which is what every president said before that. They said they have created or saved. In other words, it's bad, but it could be worse. If it wasn't for me, it would be really, really bad. Now, of course, there was very little evidence to back that up, but that was their approach. They acknowledged the pain of the American people as they were going through a tough time and said, please don't blame me for it. I'm trying to fix it. I didn't buy that. The American people eh, didn't really buy it either. Maybe a little bit, a lot more than me. But at least it was a tactic that made sense. The tactic now from the Biden administration is you guys don't understand what you're talking about. Things are wonderful right now. Why do you keep complaining about it? Listen to Joe Biden with Jimmy Kimmel. We have the fastest growing economy in the world, the world, the world. Three times. We have 8.6 million new jobs just since I got in office. Unemployment rates down to 3.6 percent. We've reduced the deficit last year by $320 billion. This year, we're going to reduce it by $1.7 trillion, trillion dollars. Right. And so right. we're the strongest no economy, and that's up. allowed us at uh. least to stay on top of and a little bit ahead of what's happening around the world. Now, if you could if you can get through the Mensa uh, project that is uh, Jimmy Kimmel in this interview. Right. Good follow up, Jimmy. You did a great job there. Um, you could know that he's this is obviously just him picking and cherry picking ridiculous numbers. Um, you know, we'll go through uh, the. The, the best economy in the world thing here in a second. But like, you know, we've reduced the deficit last year by 320 billion from the all time highs from the middle of the pandemic. You know, he keeps doing well since I got into office. Things are better. When, when you got into office, we were at the peak of the Delta wave. And we had no vaccines. Very few, you know, far fewer people had actually had COVID before. COVID was still in full effect. And a lot of people still had closings. We were just starting to inch out of it. He took office just as the pandemic was essentially ending. Now, he tried to keep it going for a long time. It made things much, much worse. But, you know, comparing the deficit to those levels, well, of course, you guys had all shut down the economy. Of course, the deficits were high. You guys decided to spend $5 trillion dollars. Of course, the deficits were high. That's uh, that's what happens. And um, the we have the fastest growing economy in the world, the world, the world three times for emphasis because he knows that fact so well. Well, Daily Mail has this today. The U.S. economy did see growth in 2021. Uh, figures from the U.N. International Monetary Fund show by a modest 5.7 percent, a figure beaten by more than 50 other countries. That showed faster growth that year. But just the 50 others, I mean, how many countries are there? Rwanda didn't grow as fast. And how about that? You know, you got to be excited about that fact. The the truth is, of course, any growth in the last year is coming out. It's just any any look. I, I, I would love to if my favorite president was in office, I'd love to give him credit for it. But the bottom line is it's really hard to screw up when you spend seven trillion dollars. You're going to get some sort of economic boost out of that. And you're coming out of a recession in which uh, which was caused by covid. A uh, you know, a, a I don't want to say that I don't want it to come off as like I'm saying the covid thing wasn't real. It, it was. But it, it still was a non-economic recession, right? This was a recession because people were told to stay home. Well, if if you can't improve off of a time where no one's at work, I mean, you're going to brag about that? Really? It's hard to uh, it's hard to understand. But Biden keeps going down this road. He actually wants you to believe that the pee on your leg is is just merely rain. Listen. The job market is the strongest it's been since World War II, notwithstanding the inflation. We added another 390,000 jobs last month, 8,700,000 new jobs since I took office. I mean, obviously, An all-time record, never that many jobs in that period of time. Listen, that enthusiastic Unemployment applause. rate is near historic lows. Millions of Americans are moving up to better jobs and better pay. And since I took office, Families are carrying less debt on average in America. They have more savings than they've had. And we're doing it all while cutting the federal deficit by $1.7 trillion this year and $320 billion last. Now, some of those are repeat repeat claims that we just beat up. But let me at least hit 
the part where he says, well, people have more savings and uh, they have uh, they have more savings and they have better jobs and better pay. Well, when you give everybody multiple trillions of dollars and you spread that out over the economy, seven trillion dollars, more money than we've ever spent on anything in our history. And you tell them they could stay home and take unemployment for an incredible amount of time. They don't have to return to work. In fact, people won't even let them return to work. The businesses are closed. And then you open them up and create a, all sorts of supply chain problems. Well, you know, it's going to turn into a pretty good job market at that point. Half the people can just stay home because they've been, you've given them a bunch of free money. And the other half is, is coming back to work in a job market where everybody, with this explosion of demand, everybody needs to hire people. So over the short term, you're going to get that bump. Of course, as has been noted multiple times on this particular program, those job uh, that are those new jobs that are coming in, yes, they are slightly higher when it comes to pay. The problem is, of course, that inflation is outpacing that. So if you get a 5% raise, but inflation is 10%, do you feel good about that? Do you feel good about it when you get a 5% raise and your gas is up 100%? Does anybody like that? Does anyone going to make that trade? I mean, I guess Joe Biden would. It's absolutely ridiculous what he's trying to do here. Um, they are trying to say, however, that things like gas prices, they're trying to have it both ways on that. When they came into office, it was with a pitch to win the Democratic primary that they were going to be super tough on fossil fuels, that they were going to change uh, the entire country and our energy usage, that we were no longer going to be a fossil fuel burning con country. We're going to get it all out of here by 2030. All these huge promises. We're going to take drastic action. Day one, dozens of things I'm going to sign to make sure we get off of fossil fuels. And then gas prices go up and everyone says, hey, remember all that stuff you were saying about Getting us off of fossil fuels, that looks pretty dumb now. And their answer, amazingly, is this. Am I comfortable? I mean, I certainly support the president and his uh, national security team. Uh, no one knows more about, you know, national affairs uh, than President Biden. Stop it. And I would say that he is very serious when the president, when he says he's going to use every arrow in his quiver in order to bring down gas prices for Americans. You know, they've done a, it's amazing. First of all, congratulations to her for saying that with a straight face. That was not easy. I have to imagine she was just cracking up the second the camera went off. But you can't say you're doing everything you can to get us off of fossil fuels. And then the next day say you're doing everything you can to lower gas prices. That's not true. The way you lower gas prices in a real way, not a gimmicky way, not taking two cents off the gas prices, the way you do that is by increasing supply, by encouraging companies to get more oil, to get more gas, to make sure this doesn't happen again in the future. And of course, these companies are terrified of the Biden administration because he came into office saying he was, they were going to be eliminated because of his policies. Now he's trying to say, well, to the environmentalist crew, hey, don't worry, we're going to stop fossil fuels and we're going to make it impossible. And then looks the other way when prices goes up and say, we had nothing to do with that. We haven't done anything to restrict fossil fuels. What are you talking about? That's crazy. Remember, they were bragging about their gimmicky uh, gas price drop in November over a two week period from 340 to about 338. Do you remember this graph? This came from the Democrats. We showed you this last week. And it, is, uh, it was accompanied with the tweet, thanks, Joe Biden. Well, we decided to extend that graph, so you know how this one turned out. And here we go. There it is now. Where is that thanks Joe Biden piece? Oh, here it is. That little red triangle or uh, rectangle right there. That's when they said, thanks, Joe Biden. Oh, yes. And by the way, that whole Putin price hike we've heard so much about. When you look at the trends here, that Putin price hike doesn't look all that impressive. You see a little bump. But it was on the same trajectory it was before. That's because Putin and his price hike, while real, has really nothing to do with this particular problem. And that particular problem is Joe Robinette Biden Jr. And yes, Robinette is his real middle name. What happened, by the way, uh, you know, because I just showed you that that was last week we gave you that chart. What happened this week, was I hiding some big price decrease? Uh, no, the gas prices have hit a new record high. Now, $5.01 a gallon, according to AAA. Uh, it's up 16 cents from last week. 
What an incredible, uh, an incredible time we live in. The national average one year ago was three dollars and seven cents. I have been doing this thing, uh, you know, talking about politics and news for a very long time. And I remember Glenn and I back years and years ago, we would talk about how America is great and how you'd rather be in America than anywhere else, despite all of its problems. And one of the dumb little examples we would use was imagine if you lived in like the UK where they're paying five dollars a gallon in gas. And we would say that like with disdain. It's impossible that for that ever to happen here. Right. Well, here we are, not in one place, not just in California at one gas station. Those are those numbers are ten dollars a gallon. Now, if you want to go that direction, we showed you one last week, nine seventy six a gallon in California at one gas station. But the average is five dollars. At what point do people throw their hands up and say, I can't do this anymore? Uh, This is why they want you to focus on January 6th. This is why they want you to focus on some dumb gun compromise. They want, they're desperate for you to avoid what is actually happening in this country. I want to give you this. This is something um, we've talked about a decent amount, the baby formula shortage. Now, if you remember, we did a story last week uh, reporting from inside the White House where they said that Joe Biden didn't know about the baby formula shortage for a while. And he didn't take any action until May. In May, he finally elevated it to a, a, an actual you know, top-level crisis. May. I want to show you this. This is something uh, for a friend of mine who has a baby who has uh, a special uh, need for, for a special formula. And this is an exchange I had with him, and I want to share it with you here. Uh, we were supposed to hang out. He says, uh, hey, I'll probably need to do closer to five if possible. There's a slight chance I might have to cancel some BS recall on every single can of, the, of his baby formula. So I may be on a scavenger hunt to try to find some later on. Text back. She found one can. So I have to be around six for me to go find more and then update it again. I'll keep you updated as it gets closer. The one can we found is a recalled can, too. So we're still searching. And the reason why I show this to you is not because I mean, this is an experience that a lot of people have gone through now. But look at the date on this. February 18th. February 18th. This guy didn't make this a high level crisis until May. These people were driving around the country trying to find any baby formula for months and months and months before Joe Biden even woke up to the problem. This is how bad your president is. He is a catastrophe. And of course, it's not just baby food. Rising food prices are changing the way we eat and shop, says Axios. The consumer price index for food at home is up 11.9 percent. This is the highest it has been since 1979. And we're probably only a month away from breaking that record. Add on to all of this today. We had a a nice little collapse in the market, 600 points in the Dow. It was down even a little bit more than that at one point. Same thing happening over in the crypto world. Bitcoin now below $24,000, which is really, really far off of its all-time highs, though it's still up quite a bit over the past couple of years. And then you go to uh, inflation. Now, we know that's 8.6%. The the U.S. uh, inflation quickens to a 40-year high, uh, pressuring the Fed and Biden to 8.6%. And this is the really bad news uh, that I want to tell you about from today, because At some level, what Biden has tried to do is come up with every little gimmick to make this go away, right? You have this major problem. You have to make it go away. How are you going to do that? Well, it's hard, but they they open up the gas, uh, the strategic oil reserves. They, you know, they fly in baby formula from overseas. Gimmick, 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 but nothing real. At some point, you realize this is so bad, we just have to kind of flush it and say, look, we're not going to be able to turn this around. This came out today. The bad inflation report raises odds of a surprise 0.75 percentage point uh, rate rise this week. 0.75 is much more than the Fed has said they're going to do. And if that happens, it would be an admission from the Fed that, holy crap, this is out of control. We need, act, we need to act aggressively right now. If this happens, at some level, it's understandable because of inflation and all the problems that are going on. On the other hand, that, that means we're in for some real short-term economic pain at the very least. Those rates start going up like that. The markets are going to freak out like they did today. It's a major problem. Um, let's listen to Larry Summers talking about uh, what might be coming around the corner. 
Secretary Yellen, who has the job you once had, said this week that, quote, there is nothing to suggest a recession is in the works. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. You think um, a recession is in the works? I think that when, infl I think when inflation is as high as it is right now and unemployment is as low as it is right now, it's almost always been followed within two years by inflation, by, by recession. I look at what's happening in the stock and bond markets. I look at where consumer sentiment is. I think there's certainly a risk of recession in the next year. And I think given where we've gotten to, it's more likely than not that we'll have a recession within the next two years. You know, recessions usually are the thing that you look back at. You'd say, OK, hey, inflation or uh, recession started. It started in this month. And we know that now uh, we, it started in this quarter. We know that now. I think the, the reality is it's very likely that we're already in one. You know, we might not know this for a while because you have usually two consecutive quarters of negative growth, but we may be in one right now. And the only thing that might bail us out of it in the short term is inflation. That's not something to brag about. That's bad. It's bad overall. Uh, Washington Post is also admitting what is true. And I think there's a there's a little bit of throwing your hands up and just realizing this is just going to be a bad year. Let's take the pain now and hopefully we can turn it around later. That's the thing that Biden, you've seen him change his tone a little bit when talking about inflation. Because in the beginning, a lot of Democrats were saying, hey, look, the economy, it's doing great. It's the best in you know record number of years. And people weren't feeling that. People were saying, why are you telling me it's good when all these prices are going up? So you are starting to see Democrats shift the messaging a little bit to talk more about and have that empathy. But whether that is a little too late, we're still a couple months away, but it could be a little too late for a lot of these people who are saying, we need help now. Too little, too late. That is the story of the Joe Biden presidency and honestly, most of his life, frankly. <laughs> that's, just, that's just a separate commentary to the trouble that we're in. The gas prices are still maybe the biggest focus. It, all you have to do is buy an electric car, though. I mean, what's the, what's the problem, guys? Just buy an electric car. It's no big deal. We'll talk to Alex Epstein in just a second about the future of fossil fuels in this country and what we should be doing. That's next. If you're looking to sell a home, this might be a pretty good time to do it. Uh, right now, we're seeing one of the best markets for sellers we've seen in a long time. How long will that last? If they start jacking up rates like they're talking about doing, it's going to be a lot harder to get that price for your home. So if you're thinking, maybe I want to try to cash out now uh, from a home, this might be a good time for it. Uh, realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find the best real estate agent in your area. No matter where you live, you can always find the best agent in your area by going to realestateagentsitrust.com. You know how important of a transaction this is. You need to nail it, and you need someone who knows what they're doing on your side of the transaction. And if you're buying some, you know, look, you might have to buy now. You might think prices are a little high, but you got to do it anyway. Well, you don't want to get stuck with a bad deal. You don't want someone on your side who knows what the market is like and what you can try to get out of this five or ten years in the future. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find the best person for you. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. I want to bring in Alex Epstein. He's the founder and CEO of the Center for Industrial Progress and the author of the new book, Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas not less. It's available now. Be sure to grab a copy wherever you get your books. Alex, how's it going? It's going well. Good to see you, Stu. Good to see you. I want to have you on for an extended interview uh, soon because when I get the chance to go through the whole book, the news cycle and stuff, I haven't even got into it yet, and I'm dying to read this book. It's, it's been yeah, I'm really dying to do that. I think I think we'll have a really good discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's been several years in the making, and we've talked about the preview here uh, a couple of times, and I want to really go in depth on this. But I want to kind of get you in here first of all to let people know that the book is out, that they can get it. And, uh, and, and kind of give you a preview of the book and also go through a couple of really big stories going on that are hitting people really hard right now. Uh, the energy world is really in focus at this exact moment. Yeah, which is a good, it's a good thing. I mean, I'm glad I finally finished the book because it's really needed right now. <laughs> it really is. So let's start with gas prices because, you know, we are told that the reason why gas prices are so high is the Putin price hike. Uh, is that true? And what's the real, what's the real story if not? Well, we had rising gasoline prices well before the invasion 
which is why everyone was complaining was they were offering a whole bunch of other excuses. So it's just been the endless excuse train. So, I mean, the Putin thing is, is obviously a significant variable, uh, but you've had, what is it? Price gouging. Uh, <laughs> companies are like making business decisions to have windfall profits. It's just everything but the obvious, which is that there is a global popular movement or popular among governments anyway, to restrict fossil fuel investment, fossil fuel production, fossil fuel transportation, i.e. fossil fuel supply. What happens when you artificially restrict the supply of something and you don't have a viable replacement, prices go up, it's supply and demand. So it's very simple, but everyone who's responsible for this wants all of these complex or just totally unrelated explanations, pseudo explanations, because they would have to admit responsibility and they would have to admit that people like me are being vindicated. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. Wa you know, watching your work all of these years, Alex. I mean, I know the answer to a lot of these questions. That you know, look, the the enemy should not be fossil fuels. But that what you said of restrict all these things they've done to restrict supply. It's true, but it was also there. They were advertising that in the campaign. Yeah. This was what they were promising to bring to America. And now that prices are out of control, all of a sudden they're saying they haven't done anything to restrict supply. Yeah, I mean, we had a president or a candidate running on, I guarantee you, we're going to end fossil fuel, right? That wasn't so ambiguous. And he's threatening to throw executives in jail and he talks about no more drilling. And I think, what would you conclude if you're the industry? Has Biden done anything or has the global anti-fossil fuel movement done anything to, to indicate that they're actually repenting and now they have a long-term commitment to supporting the freedom to pursue fossil fuels and profit from fossil fuels? Because that's what's necessary to encourage more investment and production. You need the freedom to do it and to profit from it. And there's been no indication of that at all. There's just been an indication that these guys don't like low polls. So <laughs> what company that has any responsibility or intelligence is going to go out of their way to drill more knowing that they're threatened to help Biden's poll numbers? Yeah, you know, and I feel like we keep seeing both sides of these arguments over and over again. They, they, they keep claiming, like, for example, they keep saying um, that the, one of the big problems is that oil companies are super duper greedy. They just want more money. Mm -hmm. they, all they want to do is pollute the earth with as much oil as they can to make as much money as they can. At the same time, we're told that they've got 9,000 leases that they could access and be pumping oil like crazy to make more money, but they don't want to do it for some strange reason. Can you, can you square that circle at all? Yeah, I mean, look, companies want to do things that they expect to be profitable. It's very, very simple. So again, this is a very simple issue, and they're just dragging out all of these things people don't understand to um, to make it complex. At, at, at my website, my substack, alexepstein.substack.com, I have something about the Democrats' denial, and it goes into like the six different fallacies. So the lease is one is, the fact that you have a lease doesn't mean that you regard it as economically viable for a number of reasons. The government's role is to keep us free so that as many leases as possible are economically viable, whereas when you have a government that's threatening everyone, there are going to be fewer economically viable leases. So the, the, they just have to admit this fundamental that they're restricting investment, production, and transportation, and they're threatening the future. So that needs to change. And I was on Cudlow earlier, and people think this is controversial, but we need to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, and everyone needs to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. I mean, that's, that's the key thing. How is the fossil fuel industry going to produce more if we have this global commitment to rapidly destroying that industry? Mm. Um, one of the things we're also hearing right now is you shouldn't, you know, the gas prices, yeah, they're high, but that's why you should go out and get an electric car. That'll solve this problem. I mean, it sounds a, li a bit like the legend of let them eat cake, but they, they want this to be the idea that you could just solve this problem forever by going out and getting a Tesla. What state are you in, Stu? Uh, I'm in Texas. I'm in California. Have we had any electric? Has electricity been a problem-free zone <laughs> in either of our states in recent memory? So, what's going to happen? And there are many objections to this whole thing, but what's going to happen if we mandate an in enormous increase in electricity consumption when we are already having trouble meeting 
existing demand. And is anyone aware of what's happened to coal prices and natural gas prices? Where does the electricity come from? It doesn't just come from the plug, and it doesn't come mostly from solar and wind because those depend on having a totally reliable backup, basically 100% of the time. So this is just a totally ignorant thing. And it is also let, let them eat cake, right? Because it's not saying, hey, we've made EVs so cheap. A lot of those claims are, have just kept coming false despite you know, it's despite the, the, these predictions, it's just it's not the most cost effective thing for most people. And they're saying, well, we'll just keep having policies that will make gasoline so expensive that eventually you'll have to make this terrible choice between something you can't afford and something else you can't afford. Hmm. I know, uh, Alex, you spent a bunch of time talking about how we shouldn't be thinking uh, about the environment as a, a good for the environment, bad for the environment sort of like uh, decision. It's not, that's, it, we, we should be thinking about human beings and how, the, yeah. how they are best served. But is there a, even an argument just from the environmental standpoint on electric cars? Obviously going, you know, making them, the production of electric cars seems to be very taxing on natural resources. And, you know, maybe if you run them for a couple hundred thousand miles, you start breaking even, but I don't even, it doesn't seem like the math is even there on electric cars yet. I, I don't ever, for, you know, I like what you said. I don't, I don't talk about things in terms of the environment, protecting the environment, because that that makes our environment something above us mm. versus a means to us flourishing. So I think about, you know, I want the earth to be a good human environment. And from that perspective, you do need to think about resource constraints. And the main way to figure those out is to leave people free. But we're seeing already lithium prices skyrocketing. Uh, we're seeing that, you know, when you're talking about 100, 1,000 fold increases in lithium production and all of these different elements, you have to question how well are those gonna scale? And you don't know that they're gonna scale. And you have all these people who are claiming that, oh yeah, it's gonna be so easy to do this. And they haven't thought it through at all. And they don't really care because what they're focused on is how do we eliminate fossil fuels, but also how do we eliminate hydro and eliminating nuclear? And they're hostile to mining. Right. So how is this amazing amount of mining going to occur with an anti-mining movement? This is why in, in Fossil Future in Chapter 1, I talk about how it's not just a hostility toward fossil fuels. It's a hostility toward all forms of cost-effective energy and the productive processes. And what that points to, which I reveal in Chapter 3, is it's really about a hostility toward human impact and a view that our goal should be to eliminate our impact on Earth versus advance human flourishing on Earth. Uh, you mentioned, too, that the best way to get to these ends is for people to be able to make their own decisions, right, and, and, and be able to look for the, the, the best possible tools to, to help human beings flourish. That's usually what people will do. They're going to want to chase things that improve their lives the most. There is a, a big case going on with the Supreme Court. It didn't come out today, but they're expected here in the next couple of weeks, where they're talking about the ability for the U.S. government to regulate power plants. And this has been something that the government has tried to do for a long time. They, they want to be able to do this outside of even Congress. They want the EPA and other agencies to, to, to handle this stuff so that, you know, Congress people don't have their fingerprints on it and they can have it, you know, they can do it without any of the repercussions of the higher energy costs. Do you have any idea how this thing is going to turn out and what kind of impact will it have? I don't know how it's going to turn out. I know how I hope it turns out. <laughs> I mean, these these executive orders, and this is not, there's no administration recently that I think has been totally innocent in this regard, but the ability to just make all of these policies by executive order is really terrifying and not constitutional. Like there's, we have this whole idea of a separation of powers where one side is making the laws, right? It's they're legislating and the other side is executing, but they're executing the law. They don't get to just make the law whatever they want. And what, one revealing thing was in this discussion of build back better, which I think should have been called uh, make everything worse. <laughs> you know, Gina McCarthy said, hey, you know, if this doesn't get passed, don't worry, because we're going to interpret the Clean Air Act and all these things to make it happen. And you're just thinking, wait a second, you have the power to interpret the existing law to mean a total overhaul of the American economy. I mean, overhaul is a euphemism, like the total destruction of the American economy. And by the way, we also think that we can just sign treaties and not call them treaties. Like the Paris Agreement says we need to totally change our entire economy. And that's not a treaty. The Senate doesn't have to ratify it. So we have this total abuse of federal power. And I really hope the Supreme Court takes a stand. That really is. The process is important and it exists for a reason. Um, before we let you go here, because I know your book is out, it's doing really well and, you know, it's being very well received, which I think is, is, is a really not, not according to the New York Times, though, even <laughs> no. though it, it outsold 
every book on their list but one, it didn't make the top 15, even though it outsold some of them by a factor of five. That's incredible. They did the same thing to Glenn Beck with his latest book. Big it, surprise. Uh, yeah, it really is. I mean, it, I will say, and I've mentioned this before, when we were first starting to write books with Glenn, uh, one of his first books came out and we were number two and we had outsold the number one book and we were so mad about it. Now, you could be the number one book and they'll just leave amazing. you off the look. They'll leave you off the list completely. It's fascinating to see it happen. I made up a new term, which is New York Times outseller. So I'm, I'm number two on the New York Times outseller, outseller list. list. Congratulations. That's a great one. I love that. Um, Thank you. Uh, but so, Alex, for people who don't necessarily, maybe they didn't read uh, Moral Case for Fossil Fuels or, or, or your previous work, kind of give an outline on, because, you know, one of the things that I think is important is that there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. That's what everyone always talks about. And, and the trade-off for this supposed environmental future is it's at the cost of human flourishing. And that, 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 the good that has come from fossil fuels, as opposed to what could come uh, as a negative from this big transition that we're going to have, is something I know you talk a lot about. Can you kind of walk people through the thesis of the book? Sure. Although it occurs to me, I don't really love that expression. There's something true to it. But in a hmm. sense, a solution is anything where the positives outweigh the negatives, or as I talk about it, the benefits outweigh the side effects. So would you say, well, there's no solution to polio, there's only trade-offs? Well, the polio vaccine and <laughs> you know subsequent versions, that was a really good solution. And so, yes. but the, the truth of that statement, so there's something I don't like, but there's something I like, which is that you look at trade-offs. So the way I think of it is you look at fossil fuels like you would look at a prescription drug. You carefully weigh the benefits and the side effects. And I think the cause of today's energy crisis, why we've restricted fossil fuels so mercilessly, is we've been taught by our leading thinkers to ignore the benefits of fossil fuels to human flourishing. And those benefits are, are huge. So it's things like having modern agriculture where one worker can do the work that 1,000 used to be able to do. It's having these magical machines that no number of human beings used to be able to replicate, such as an incubator that saves countless millions of lives, and yet those don't exist in much of the world because they don't have reliable electricity. And so I think when you look at the benefits of fossil fuels, they far, far outweigh the side effects. And maybe the most important thing for people to get is this is especially true in climate. People think of it as, oh, well, energy makes our environment worse, but it has other benefits. And I don't think of it that way at all. I think nature, energy rather, makes nature a much better environment. And climate is example number one. We used to have just millions and millions of climate-related disaster deaths because the natural climate is so dangerous, so hostile, so difficult to deal with. And now we've had a 98% decline in climate-related disaster deaths over the last century, in large part because we've had all these amazing fossil-fueled machines that heat us when it's cold, right? that cool us when it's hot, that allow us to irrigate and alleviate drought, that allow us to bring food from where it is uh, to where it isn't. We just have all these amazing machines that are making us so safe from climate, and yet we think we have a climate catastrophe. And, and sort of the root of all of this is the reason we're ignoring the benefits is because our leading thinkers aren't thinking about their goal isn't advancing human flourishing on Earth. And so they don't really think of all the benefits of fossil fuels as benefits. They think of them as impositions on the Earth. They think mm. that our whole civilization that that's supporting 8 billion people, that that's just wrong. We shouldn't be impacting the Earth. We shouldn't be impacting the climate. And so they focus on these disastrous scenarios to scare us away from doing it. But really, they know fossil fuels are really good for us. They just don't think the focus should be on us. They think it should be on an unimpacted planet, which is really just hatred of humans, uh, because it just means you're singling out humans as the worst thing in nature and you want to see them disappear as much as possible. Mm, it's, and it's amazing. I mean, you talk about a 98% drop in climate-related uh, deaths. I mean, in any other context, that would be a miracle. I mean, people would be talking yeah. about it like people well, talk about polio, right, and the vaccine. And we got we to gotta change that. Like, I think of it as we're not in a climate crisis, we're in a climate renaissance. And and one thing you don't want to do, I know you like the term arguing to zero, and you've, you've brought it up recently. You actually caught me. You actually taught me a version of it last time, uh -huh. um, is... You know, you think about like the, the usual response is, well, fossil fuels are like they're good. They're, they're like sort of bad climate wise. Of course, they're bad climate wise, but they're not as bad as you think. Mm -hmm. Right. Versus no fossil fuels are good climate wise. They enable us to master climate. And that's the thing that matters most. How much of an ability do you have to master climate? Because if you don't have an ability to master climate, climate will be dangerous. It'll be ruinous. And if you do not only are the negatives of climate diminished, but you can even turn them into positives. Like mm -hmm. I like going snowboarding in Utah 
right? That used to be a very negative environment. Now it's a positive environment that I have to pay quite a bit of money uh, <laughs> to go to. And so it's just, we need to think of climate in a modern way where we're masters of climate, not in a primitive way of 5,000 years ago where we're afraid of climate and we think that if we have a climate problem, it's because we offended the climate gods. Well, I could talk to you all day about this. And I will say coming in out of 107 degree uh, Texas weather into 70 degree air conditioning made me think master of climate is better. We'll get into this more though next time we talk. Uh, Alex Epstein and founder and CEO of the Center for Industrial Progress. His newest book is Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Coal, o uh, Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. Make sure to grab a copy today. I guarantee you're going to want this. You're going to refer back to it a million times every time you're talking to your friends about these types of to topics. Alex, thanks so much for coming on, man. Great to see you, Stu. The point I would agree with is the New York Times buried this. Yeah, it was like if a this tiny had thing been below a, the fold. If this had been a liberal Supreme Court justice that someone came to kill, it would, have been on the, it would have been on the front page. And that's what's so disappointing about a paper like the New York Times. Because they just wear their bias on their sleeves. And they, if it's not part of something that feeds our narrative, f*** it. Now, you know, at this point, I'm not even surprised at Bill Maher saying things like this. But I am surprised that the audience actually clapped at that point. Which is a great point, by the way. None of the Sunday shows mentioned this, with the exception of Fox News Sunday. None of them. Not CNN, not ABC, not CBS, not ABC. None of them even mentioned a sitting Supreme Court justice almost being killed and an attempted murder charge being filed in, two, in the previous 48 hours before these show, uh, shows aired. It's absolutely incredible. I have a very low expectation for the media, but this is setting records. It really is amazing. Of course, they've got to focus on the January 6th hearings, which are going on right now at a theater near you. Prime time, everybody. Um, I, one thing I find fascinating about this is because it's such a show. Uh, I don't think anybody watching this who's followed this story at all has heard anything that hasn't been reported previously. I mean, Bill Barr saying that he didn't think the election was stolen is told chapter and verse in Bill Barr's book. He also, uh, all those reports and quotes came out in the weeks after the election. He did a, a lengthy podcast with our own Glenn Beck where he described many of these same scenarios. It's just not even interesting at this point. Um, but it, there, there may be a, maybe there was a world where they didn't go through with this fake second impeachment in the days after January 6th. And he said, OK, we're going to do we're going to take our time. And I said this at the time. Take your time. Go through. Look at all the evidence. See what you have. Maybe you do have something that would convince people not to vote for Donald Trump or that he should never be allowed in the White House again. Who knows what it might teach people? But instead, they went away with this fake sort of like, throw him out because that, did you see that riot? It was bad. We don't know if he was responsible in any way. We have no evidence to prove that, but he's really bad. They did that first. Now they're rolling this back out because they want a second bite at the apple. It's like, take two. It didn't work last time. Can we try it again? The guy seems to be leading the field in the other uh, party. Let's give this another whirl. Well, nobody, every, I think everybody's seeing through this. And uh, honestly, I don't think they've changed one mind. Back in a second. Three are, have been arrested in connection with a teenager beaten to death at the school that LeBron James runs over a water gun uh, incident. Now, I'd be lying to you if, if, I, if I said I didn't click on the story uh, because of the LeBron James tie. Uh, it's totally why I clicked on it. And that just shows weakness in my character, and I'm admitting it to you. I mean, I just don't like LeBron James, and I saw a negative headline about LeBron James, so I clicked on it. Thank you, theblaze.com. Uh, but I will say this. Um, you know, LeBron had nothing to do with this particular incident. Uh, that is true. It's a terrible incident where like a, a little water gun prank seems to have escalated and winds up in a kid in, inexplicably being killed on school grounds. I mean, it really is an awful, awful, awful story. And LeBron James is not responsible for it. Most of the other ills in our society he is, though, and I want you to remember that. It's your last week to register to be here for Power Hour. Don't miss it. StuDoesPowerHour.com. It's coming up July 8th. You can be in studio hanging with us. StuDoesPowerHour.com. We'll see you tomorrow.